Hello and welcome. The Setting Apart podcast is a pit stop where you can get nourished, encouraged, and refreshed whenever you need a break. I'm your host, IP, and every episode I get to share my stories, my outlook, my reflections on all things inspired through the lens of faith. So grab yourself a coffee, sit back, relax, and chill. This is episode six. Welcome back, my Setting Apart podcast family. I hope you had a lovely feast of Pentecost over the weekend. Now, did you know that where we got the idea of the novena, which is the nine successive days of prayer? Well, we got that in Acts chapter 1, where Mary and the apostles prayed together continuously for nine days after the ascension leading up to Pentecost. So traditionally, the church prays the novena to the Holy Spirit in the days before Pentecost. Now, that's an interesting fun fact about novena that you may or may not be aware of, but now you know. Now, for those of you who are here for the very first time, a big hello and welcome. Try to stick around all the way to the end because we have lots of good stuff coming up in this episode. And if you like what you hear, please subscribe and share the podcast with all your friends. Now, from the feedback of some of you guys, I learned that there are different ways to listen to the podcast. For example, our friends from Down Under, they host tea parties and listening to our podcast as part of their fellowship. That sounds really awesome. And then we have Nick in Canada who uses our podcast as part of his devotional time. Way to go, Nick. You, the man. I, for one, I like to listen to podcasts when commuting from one place to another, or when I'm on walks with my dog, or when I go for longer runs. So instead of listening to music, I listen to podcasts because I can actually pick up something new by listening. That way, it kind of frees up my time after my walks, my runs, or commuting to do something else. So like talk shows on radios, the setting is a lot more intimate with listeners. But unlike radios, I can rewind and play back whenever I want to. So please feel free to share the podcast if you like what you hear. And thank you for that. Question. Do you know why or how you became a Christian or Catholic? Now, I suspect that many converts like myself might have a better idea than most cradle Catholics on average in answering this question. I could be wrong, but if you really need to think hard about this one, don't worry about it. Because in this episode, I am going to share my stories leading to my call to conversion, which is a natural extension from the previous episodes. In particular, episodes 4 and 5, Saved by Grace and Invitation to Faith. If you haven't listened to them yet, I would highly recommend that you listen to them first before listening to this episode. Now, my reflection for this episode is based on the Gospel of John, John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. But first, I would love to share a testimony with you that is absolutely out of this world. It is literally God sent. It is God sent because it includes scripture in her testimony. You've got to check this out. This one is from Suzanne. And it reads as follows. Thank you for being a good brother and encouraging us. As it is written in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24. For ours is not a faith God intended to be lived out alone. Amen. And she quotes from Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 to 25. And I read. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. End of reading. And continuing her testimony, this podcast would be great for anyone exploring the Catholic faith and wondering how others made the decision to commit their lives to Christ. The stories are inspiring and relatable in many ways. 
I really appreciate how IP, that would be me, draws from the Bible, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and other credible sources helping us see how all the parts fit together harmoniously. May you continue to be an open vessel that God can use. Amen. And end of testimony. That was from Suzanne. And what a gift. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for giving us the gift of consolation from the Word of God. It is so positive, vibrant, and absolutely apt for the podcast. Just beautiful. I have two takeaways i like to share from that. First, we are building a small community of believers right here at the Setting Apart podcast. You better believe it. We are here to discover the beauty of Scripture, our love letter from God. We are here to encourage each other by sharing our stories, our testimonies. We are here to be empowered by the Word of God to live the fullness of Christian life as we know it to love and for good works, quoting the Hebrews that was quoted to me. And secondly, when two or three are gathered in the name of Christ, he is in our midst. And that's one of the ways you can have a real encounter with him. The encounter with Christ, it is the root of our faith. It will help us see the unseen and believe. Do not let that go to waste. I encourage you to be creative in sharing the podcast, just like Monica and her friends in Perth are doing. Or if any of the stories I share have stirred you up inside, by all means, have your own group sharing within your church ministry or among your friends or fellowship, because having the real encounter with Christ truly changed my life. Think out of the box. Let us know how it goes by leaving a note to the contact page of the website. I will leave a link to the website on the episode note, and thank you for that. Now, do I know why or how I became a Christian? I will share how Jesus draws me to his church. In episode four, I talked about um, the initial graces that God has given to me to draw me to Christ. In episode 5, I followed that up with how Jesus Christ is inviting us to believe after the initial graces. And typically, these are signs that he reveals to us specifically. How we respond to the sign is up to us. But he always makes the first move to reach out to us. Now, this is my call to conversion. As a background, I grew up in a non-Christian family. As far as I could tell, my late grandmother was a Buddhist, at least that which was listed officially on my identity card or IC. Funny thing is, I might have gone to a Christian kindergarten or preschool. I say that because I do remember taking part in the Nativity of the Lord's Play back then. I was probably one of the three kings who paid homage to baby Jesus. And despite having gone to uh, a Catholic school for the next 10 years, the thought of converting to Christianity never crossed my mind. And so, according to my identity card, I was a Buddhist growing up, which might have involved going to the temple with my late grandmother from time to time. And that was the extent of my involvement in Buddhism. And when my late grandmother passed on, my parents, for some reason, converted to Christianity one after another. And so I was curious. I thought my parents were quite into Buddhism when my late grandmother was around. So one day I asked my dad, Hey dad, what happened? Why did you convert to Christianity? So according to my father, he asked God for a sign if God exists. Presumably dad has been evangelized too. I mean, why would anyone ask for a sign from God out of the blue, right? In any case, dad recounted that while he was watching news one night, he was captivated by an interview to the then President Kim Dae-jung of South Korea, a Nobel Prize winner. President Kim was known for his fight for democracy in South Korea and his attempt at reconciliation with North Korea. During the military regime in South Korea, President Kim was imprisoned tortured, 
condemned to death, and twice exiled. His Catholic faith reportedly helped and supported him in those difficult times. And as reported in the press in 1973, intelligence agents of the South Korean director Park Jung-hee kidnapped him in a hotel in Tokyo and loaded him on a boat to throw him overboard at sea. When the kidnappers tied his feet to cement boulders, Kim fervently prayed to Jesus Christ to save him. And according to him, he saw Jesus. And at exactly the same moment, a large American helicopter swooped down on the boat. The captors, understanding that they were caught, gave up and Kim survived the assassination attempt. Now, on December 2000, in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize, Kim was recounting this rescue from what he believed would be his assassination after being abducted by the South Korean intelligence agents in 1973. And President Kim has this to offer. I have lived and continue to live in the belief that God is always with me. I know this from experience. So for my dad, the interview with President Kim was the sign revealed to him. He was so moved by President Kim's faith, and he believed. And that's how my dad was called to conversion. That's his story. However, it did not mean anything to me, and it did nothing for me. And from time to time, ever since, uh, whenever I connect with my parents, they would encourage me to go to church. You know, but I never did. There was no reason for me to. And a few years later, some random event took place and changed everything. You see, one day, a relative of an ex-girlfriend of mine was hospitalized at the National University Hospital, or the NUH, unexpectedly. So I gave her a ride to the hospital. Since I did not know the relative, I asked her to call when she's ready to be picked up while I drive around the university campus to kill time. So I was doing just that when I came across a building on campus with a raised parking barrier to an underground parking. So I drove in. Now, this is the weekend. There was literally no one around. I parked my car and proceeded to check out the building at the atrium level that seems to have some display going on for an exhibition. Turns out, it was an exhibition on the Nobel Prize, and of course, with displays featuring some of the winners. I thought, wow, what a perfect place for me to kill time and maybe pick up something I hadn't known about the Nobel Prize. It was quite interesting. I started with the history and proceeded to check out some of the winners who were on display. I recognized a couple of them, but many I did not know. Now, I didn't get very far when I came across a display that completely blew my mind. It was a simple display with three items. There was a robe or an outer garment hanging down from the display, a pair of shoes, and a book. Now, the robe was distinctly Korean traditional hanbok. The pair of traditional shoes was probably made in silk, and the book, the book, was unmistakably a Bible, as it was printed on the cover. It was a display of President Kim Dae-jung. This is the same President Kim whose interview with the press inspired and moved my dad to conversion. You can imagine how my jaw must have dropped when I saw the display. I mean, it brings back my conversation with my dad vividly. I remember that it did not make any impression on me then, but not this time. This, no doubt, was a sign for me. I mean, in retrospect, the event of the day couldn't have been more random and unrelated in my mind. My ex-girlfriend's relative suddenly got sick, out of the blue, was hospitalized at the NUH of all the hospitals in Singapore right? It's got to be NUH. So I dropped her off, went wandering around on campus, 
driving aimlessly initially, until I found a parkade of a nice, you know, nice-looking modern building on campus with the parking barrier raised. So it was inviting to me because parking was free, and I was killing time. So what could be more perfect than that, right? Well, it gets better. The door from the parkade to the building was unlocked. So I went in, and guess what? There was an exhibition on Nobel Prize and the Nobel laureates who have won. So everything was going swimmingly well. I needed to kill time, and here I am. There was no one around. I was checking out the place to my heart's content. And then, just when I least expected, there it was. President Kim Dae-jung, the only South Korean Nobel laureate to date. I found my sign. That's when I know. I need to check it out. There was just too many coincidences to rule out that it was merely coincidental. Shortly thereafter, I enrolled myself in a RCIA program at a church near me. RCIA stands for the Right of Christian Initiation of Adults. It is a program or process developed to gradually introduce inquirers the different aspects of Catholic beliefs and practices. It's kind of like、um, the invitation Jesus offered to his first disciples to come and see when they wanted to know more about him. The scripture. That inspired the reflection in this episode is from the Good News of John, John chapter twenty, verses twenty-four to twenty-nine. John chapter twenty, twenty-four to twenty-nine. The version I'm reading is the New American Bible, and I invite you to read along with me. It reads as follows: Thomas called Didymus. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came, so the other disciples said to him, "We have seen the Lord." But he said to them, "Unless I see the mark of the nails of his hands and put my finger into the nail marks and put my hand into his side, I will not believe." Now a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, "Peace be with you." Then he said to Thomas, "Put your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe." Thomas answered and said to him, "My Lord and my God." Jesus said to him. Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. End of reading. So the context here is that it is a continuation from the reading in episode four, where Jesus appeared to his disciples for the first time after his resurrection, but Thomas was not with them. So when the other disciples told him what they saw. Thomas's reaction was one of disbelief, since they had just witnessed Jesus's passion and death on the cross, and that Jesus was buried in a tomb, sealed by a gigantic rock and guarded by men of Pilate. So, in this reading, Jesus appeared to his disciples the second time in a week, and this time around, Thomas is present. As a side note. Thomas has been described as the doubting Thomas because of verse twenty-five, which may be a bit unfair to Saint Thomas. I feel his unbelief could conceivably be stemmed from his discouragement and fear, just as the rest of the apostles were. And in John chapter eleven, verse sixteen, we can see that Thomas actually declared that he was prepared to die with Jesus, and he would die for Jesus. And that shows that Thomas is not exactly a faithless man. So keep that in mind. And as I read this passage, the theme of seeing and believing is quite apparent, right? And the verse that stood out for me most is verse twenty-eight: "My Lord and my God." 
you are my crucified Lord. You are my resurrected God. In celebrating Easter Sunday Mass in um, St. Peter's Basilica on April 8, 2007, Pope Benedict noted that Thomas has received from the Lord and has in turn transmitted to the church the gift of a faith put to the test by the passion and death of Jesus and confirmed by meeting him risen, unquote. And presumably Thomas was the only one missing from the first encounter with the risen Lord a week ago. And when the apostles told him about the appearance of the risen Lord, he basically found it unbelievable. Having encountered Jesus a week later, however, Thomas came to believe from his unbelief and made a moving profession of his faith, my Lord and my God. So Thomas is depicted as moving from unbelief to belief after his encounter with the risen Lord. The key for me for the entire reading is Thomas's real encounter with the risen Lord. So the grace that kind of flows out from this reading to me is the gift of the real encounter with the risen Lord. Let us unpack that a little bit. To put things in context, the faith of the apostles in Jesus, the expected Messiah, had been put to a severe test by the scandal of the cross. I mean, at Jesus' passion and death, they were dispersed. The Messiah is now gone. Instead of liberating his people and ushering them to the new kingdom, he died on a cross. If he is the real Messiah, let him save himself, the people chanted. The Greeks came to see the glorified Lord, and what do they get? A slave hang on a tree. So, it is not difficult to imagine their feelings of sadness and dismay at the death of their Lord. Feelings of disbelief and even amazement of a reality that is too surreal to accept. Now, they are together again, still perplexed and bewildered. And that's when the risen Lord first comes in response to their fears to give them peace and clarity. This encounter was real, even if unexpected. As we recall from John chapter 20, verse 19, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. At these words, what little left of their faith was rekindled and renewed. Their faith was dead, but now resuscitated back to life again. The apostles told Thomas all about it. But Thomas remained doubtful and perplexed. When Jesus came for a second time in the upper room, he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. So Thomas's response is a moving profession of faith, my Lord and my God. There is so much packed in this passage, but for my reflection, I will say this. First, believing from seeing is a lot easier than not seeing yet believing. And people in the latter category are called blessed by Jesus in verse 29. Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed which is one of the Beatitudes that Jesus taught on the mount. Now, believing after seeing the risen Christ was a way limited only to the apostolic generation. You think about it, because since Jesus only died once and for all, so for all the younger generations and beyond, those who believed without having seen the Lord must have a real encounter with the risen Lord in order to truly believe. Otherwise, the faith would be on shaky ground, depending on which direction the wind blows on any given day. Now, Thomas was not denied seeing the risen Lord from his real encounter with Christ. So, in a sense, to encounter is to see. To believe, then, is to experience the real encounter with Christ. So we could experience seeing Christ up close and personal. In other words, 
To experience is the new seeing in order to believe. Make sense? That's my most important takeaway from the reading for this episode. Now, connecting the dots to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 to 25, as cited by Suzanne, when we form fellowships to share our faith, to stir up one another or to renew our faith to love and for good works, implicitly, that's where we can have real encounters with Christ in our midst, as it is written in Matthew 18, verse 20. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. On my call to conversion, without my own encounter with the Lord, I was in a state of unbelief no different from Thomas. My dad's sign was not mine. What moved him to conversion did nothing for me or to me. However, everything changed when I had my own personal encounter with God, albeit an unexpected one. Even though my sign was essentially the same or closely related to my dad's, I mean, the sign revolves around the same President Kim Dae-jung. The difference was that I had a real encounter in the latter, and the experience compelled me to respond to his call accordingly. Now, secondly, on a deeper level, Thomas's profession of faith, my Lord and my God, also depicts Thomas moving from his faith being put to the test to his faith renewed after his encounter with Christ. Now, we may all have been tempted by the unbelief of Thomas at one time or another, and I'm not going to sugarcoat this. We all experience a test to our faith in varying degrees. What if our prayers are not answered? Do we lose faith? Do we lose faith in the things that we cannot see? The future that has yet to unfold? In facing uncertainty, do we fully surrender to our Lord? Or do we seek a medium to read our future? Just like King Saul did in the first book of Samuel. He summoned the spirit of Samuel, who is dead, through the witch of Endor because the Lord did not answer his call. Do we need to see the nails in his hands? Suffering, evil, injustice, death, especially when it strikes the innocent like children or victims of war and terrorism or the latest COVID-19 pandemic. Do they not put our faith to the test? As Pope Benedict noted then in 1 Peter 2.24, Peter said, By his wounds, you have been healed. Those wounds, Pope Benedict says, were an obstacle for Thomas's faith, being a sign of Jesus' apparent failure. In his encounter with the risen Lord, those same wounds are signs of his victorious love. Only a God who loves us to the extent of taking upon himself our wounds and our pain, especially innocent suffering, is worthy of faith. Unquote. Let me be very clear. By taking upon our wounds, our pain, and our suffering, Jesus doesn't remove them for us, as it is written in Scripture. Take up your cross and follow me. He doesn't say, hand me your cross and follow me, or put down your cross and follow me, but take up your cross and follow me. He did his part. Now we got to do ours in order to follow his footsteps. Now, this is another big topic in itself, and I'm just going to leave it at that for now. Now, coming back to the test, how many of us question the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist because we cannot see? Or the truth about the perpetual virginity of his blessed mother. What is truth? Or do we need to see the wounds of his side? You see, to believe in the name of Jesus Christ is to accept all that he taught and to be obedient 
to the teaching of his church. Our faith is not a cafeteria-style religion where you can pick and choose what you like. It is an all-or-nothing religion, just like Jesus doesn't love us half-heartedly, he loves us wholeheartedly, as it is written in Scripture. Half-hearted commitment to the faith is nauseating to Christ. We can find that in Revelation 3, verse 16. Now, for those of you who may be compelled to seek the truth, seek and you shall find. Ask and you shall be given. I encourage you to check out RCIA or the Right of Christian Initiation of Adults. It is an excellent program or uh, process developed for new inquirers to come and see. And for baptized Christians, the call is for us to be renewed witnesses to our risen Lord, just like St. Thomas. Whenever our faith is put to the test, may we seek or be reminded of our real encounter with him. And like Thomas, may we profess that he is the one true God, my Lord and my God. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Setting Apart podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and get notified so you won't miss any new episodes. And please feel free to give me your ratings and reviews so that others may get to listen as well. Thank you and God bless.